So, um, let's finish up, shall we? So, we're in chapter 9 here. So, this vision uh, is now Darius, son of someone, I don't know who that's supposed to be, of Mead Stock, who ruled Chaldea. I mean, this is pretenses, but I'm sure it isn't accurate. And um, if you want to uh, try to cling on to it, well, do your best, but it probably isn't easy. <coughs> yeah, I know what it says. But I don't know. <laughs> supposed to be Esther's husband or something in the Esther books. I don't know. In the first, I don't know these kings very well, but I'm sure Daniel didn't live this long. In the first year of his reign, Daniel was uh, looking at the Bible or something, counting the numbers uh, that were revealed to Jeremiah. So he admits that he's got the 70 years from Jeremiah. That there would be 70 years of devastation. I think it's Jeremiah 29.10 in case you're interested. 70 years of devastation. Don't worry, you're, you're, you don't have to be public if you feel like you're just going to look at Jeremiah, but you don't need to read him. I find that I've never read the whole of Jeremiah myself. I'm such a you know un, uninteresting prophet. Ezekiel is the one that I find. Anyway, it's something about destructions, but you can read that passage if you're interested. So, Lord, grant me, uh, Lord, great God, you keep the covenant and have kindness of those who love you. Letter of James, if you're familiar with it. You uh, you know keep faith with those who love you. I forget how it's, it's given. I can read it to you, I suppose, but uh, I can find it in here. Uh, look here. Listen, my dear brothers, two five. It was those who are poor, according to the world, that God chose to be rich in faith, to be heirs to the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him. So loving God, there's a kingdom supposedly promised. You see, it's right here. I make, should make a note of it. Daniel, what number? I'll stick it in. I think Daniel, what is it? Nine, uh, nine five or so. Anyway, um, and keep your commandments. There's the thing you should watch. That's what you'll find Paul did not feel was necessary. So you have a problem here. It's Paul versus these books. Uh, but, you know, Paul solves that with the picture of Jesus in the scripture as old wineskins versus new wineskins. These are the old wineskins. But if these are the old wineskins, then why keep them in your Bible? Just chuck the whole thing away and just use Paul or somebody. I mean, if this says you shall keep these things, then it seems to me, and it says in perpetuity, it doesn't say that it's coming to an end sometime in any of the books of you. I don't say you should take books seriously, but if you do, it seems to me you can't ignore things and pick and choose as you want. Like they say, Bush cherry pick the intelligence or whatever. I don't like that word, but it's a popular one at the moment. We have not listened. We have betrayed your commandments and your ordinances and turned away. So this is a pro-law book, right? Pro-law, pro-covenant. -pro Hello, ordinances, uh, whatever else you want to have. We haven't listened to the, your servants, the prophets. We, the people of Judea, the citizens of Jerusalem. Uh, so really, this is uh, not at the time of Darius or something. And now the sanctuary is desolate. I was still speaking, line 20, and uh, talking about the sins of my people were punished and so on in this world, not some other. And uh, I might plead before the Lord my God and his holy mountain. And then Gabriel appeared again. The being I had originally seen came down to me, flew down, or whatever, at the hour of the evening sacrifice. Daniel, you see me. I have come down to teach you how to understand. Again, he's the teacher. You are a man specially chosen. So Gabriel's third time. Seventy weeks are decreed for your people and your holy city 
for putting an end to transgression. And so on, 70 weeks of years, I think. So that's normally considered to be 490 years. Now that is a calculation that I don't have any understanding of what it's supposed to mean. And by the way, you also good, if you had a Bible, you could see this stuff. It's no good to hear me read it. If you can't see it in front of you, you can't mark it, and you can't recall it, you should have a scrap Bible that you can play with because you probably don't want to use your family Bible to mess around. Bibles are cheap. You can buy a Bible cheaper than you can Xerox it. <laughs> so, or you can go to a used bookstore and there are a dime a dozen there. So uh, get a Bible that you can mark up because otherwise you're lost. Everything is in the Bibles that we're using. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why you might be uh, uh, at sea because you don't have the book in front of you to follow. Get a book. Bring it. You know, use it. It's important, don't you think? Those guys who have Bibles, it's, you can't make any headway in this stuff by just hearing someone talk about it. But you're going to have it in front of you, and then you see it, it jumps out. The translation may not be exactly as I'm doing in your, in your version. Anyway, so then know this. Return and rebuild Jerusalem. The coming of an anointed prince, seven weeks, 62 weeks. I don't understand all this stuff. But after 62 weeks, an anointed one will be cut off. In the Maccabee books, we do have an anointed one, meaning a, a priest is also anointed. Um, someone called Onias, the high priest, is killed at one point in the Maccabee books. And I think you'll find that this is the one that's supposed to be talked about here. But it doesn't matter. I'm just saying that that looks like it relates to that. So the person writing this again is after that time. He's not foreseeing it. And then you will make a covenant with the many, sanctuary will be destroyed, devastation decreed. And for a space of a week, here's the, here's the big one. A week, one half week, he will put a stop to sacrifice. And on the wing of the temple will be the disastrous abomination. That's where it's first uh, mentioned. And that disastrous, of, or the abomination of the desolation, whatever you want to call it, the reason why is it famous? Because it's mentioned in the little apocalypses in the Gospels, <laughs> where Jesus comes out of the temple and gives his view of what's going to happen. And he says, when you see the abomination of the desolation standing where it ought not to stand, take to the hills. So he's picking up or the person writing his speech for him. Think it's Jesus, then whoever had the tape recorder. If you don't think it's Jesus, if you think it's some Greek guy putting words in his mouth, then whoever did that. But in any case, they're using Daniel. Someone is using Daniel, and they're referring here. Um, so ten doesn't. That's been. There's a time attempted there. In the third year of Cyrus, oh, we're further down the line. I, Daniel, was doing a three-week penance. I ate no um, heavy food, meaning meat, probably. Touched no meat or wine. Did not anoint myself. This is a Nazarite situation. And later on, if we uh, look at James at all, the so-called brother of Jesus, we'll find that this is what's said about him, that he ate no meat. He, uh, he, um, he, he, uh, Where is that? What line is that? There it is. Line 10, 3. I did not anoint myself, did not drink wine, and that's all the things are said of James in early church literature. He was a lifelong Nazarite, as they call it. This is a temporary Nazarite, only for a period of time. Anyway, I was on the Tigris River, where the American troops are today. And I looked up, and there's this crazy vision here of a man in barrel and lightning. That's, again, uh, Ezekiel. -like. And I fell to the ground, and the hand touched me, and I think this is, talks about Michael here at line 13. This is very disjointed here. I mean, I'm not trying to make sense of it. Um, anyway, they speak about a book of truth in line to the end of that. I must go back and fight the Prince of Persia. Michael's already fighting here. Michael's a fighting angel. Uh, guardian angel of Israel, he does fighting. He'll do that in the war scroll and some other documents in the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
Three more kings are going to rise in Persia in the next chapter. I guess we're in chapter 11. The fourth will become richer than all the others. That's Xerxes, the one who fights in Greece the Battle of Marathon. He has grown powerful. He will challenge the kingdoms of, you have Greece. See, I have Javan. Yavon, which is the original Hebrew. Who else has? Anyone else have Javon or Yavon here? <laughs> you all have Greece where they really updated it. They didn't used to have any Bibles. So these are new Bibles. They've given up the ghost on this Greece thing. Because they used to say, oh, that's not Greece. But I guess they've all surrendered on that issue. A mighty king will rise, reign over a vast empire. That's Alexander again. Once again, we're always back to the same thing. And his kingdom would cross out the four winds of heaven as the four successor kingdoms, John Alexander the Great again. So this is getting tiresome now, isn't it? We're getting the same vision over and over and over again. And that's all this guy knows. Does he tell us about Julius Caesar, as someone's thought he might do here? Does he tell us about uh, Genghis Khan? Does he tell us about King Arthur? Does he tell us about Charlemagne? Uh, Emperor Chu of China? Does he tell us about uh, Ronald Reagan, FDR, no, Joe Stalin, no, he only goes up to Alexander and his successors. So the guy is not a prophet, as we would. he just tells you what he knows, he's just putting history in a different form for your Anyway, so his emperor will be broken up, parceled out to the four winds, though not to his descendants, because they marry, as you know, local people in these areas. And then we get the invasion of the land of splendor again. I'm getting tired of this. By 15, the king of the north will capture a strongly fortified city. That's the Seleucids. I don't know which is the city, but maybe it's Jerusalem. And his fight with the king of the south, the Ptolemies. Seleucids fighting the Ptolemies in the 300s and the 200s B.C. And then there will arise a wretch. He's the same person again, 21. Who's the wretch that will rise? Alex, Antiochus Epiphanes. What's the date? 175 or so BC. And he will intrigue, and then he will be cruel. He will armies will be utterly routed and crushed. The Prince of the Covenant. <coughs> I have a footnote here. Prince of the Covenant. Um, Let's see, probably the priest of Nias the third. Anyway, it's one of these high priests. And he will have his heart set against the Holy Covenant, line 29. And here's a good point for our purposes. In due time, he will make his way south again. This king from Seleucid North. See, Palestine is the area or the Holy Land where these kings are doing their fighting back and forth. For a while, it was under the control of the Ptolemies in the more tolerant, cultural-minded uh, descendants of Alexander the Great in Egypt. They started the Great Library there of Alexandria and everything else. They had three basic populations in Alexandria, Greek, Egyptian, and Jewish. They didn't get along mostly, but they were three quarters of uh, that city. It's a new city he built, in case you were not familiar with it, when he conquered Egypt in 333 BC. In any case, uh, but here at this point, this is uh, 100 years later, at least, maybe 125, 30 years later. In due time, he will make his way south again, but this time the outcome will not be as previously. The ships of the Kittim will oppose him, and he will be defeated at sea. Do you have ships of the Kittim there? What do you guys have there? Western coastline? <laughs> That's the problem with translate, pardon me. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you have Katim? You have Katim? You don't have Bible? Since you have Katim? It could also be Cyprus. No, 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 no. no, no, no forget the footnotes. I'll tell you who the Katim are. That guy doesn't know any more than me than the footnotes. <laughs> You'll test me anyway. <laughs> this is an important point because <coughs> Katim probably did at one point mean something is a general expression, and the reason you have, uh, what do you have, Western ships? Yeah, Romans. It is Romans at this point, yeah. From the, from the history of the period, uh, we know that it is. What do you have in your Bible, the young lady with the blue shirt? Oh, I have the Western. What? Coastlands. 
Western coast, what? Coastlands. Coastlands. Oh, ships from the western coast. That's good. That's a, it's a general phrase meaning from the west, invaders from the west. It originally probably comes from way, 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 way back. Kit, kit. What does it sound like to you? Kit, kit. Crete. Mm -hmm. It was probably originally a term they used to refer to the Cretans. Cretan, kittens, kit, kit, kit. You know, these are always garbled things. So probably it was when Crete was a great country in the 1300 BC or something. It probably originally came from there. Then it probably got drawn in closer to Cyprus. So you guys have a footnote on Cyprus. But you see, it's clear that they're going to apply it to every foreigner coming on ships from the West. At this point, as we know from the history, maybe in your footnotes, I think it's the Roman general Scipio who's been fighting the Carthaginians. Anyway, the Romans are beginning to be felt in this area, and they're extending into the eastern Mediterranean, and they do have a sea battle with the Seleucids at this point, and that's what's being recorded. So this very important, Katim at this moment mean Romans. Now that's going to be extremely important <coughs> because the big argument in the Dead Sea Scrolls is going to be who are the Katim in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because the Katim or Katanes, or we want to call them, in Hebrew Katim, in English Katanes, or you know, any other. That's why you see it's dangerous these translations that don't give you the original language. You've already got one hand tied behind you. So the Ketim are going to be very important. Why? It's something in the scrolls. It's the term used for the foreign armies in the scrolls invading the country. It's the term used for who the Dead Sea Scrolls people are fighting. Now, the question is, in Dead Sea Scrolls studies, there's a whole group of scholars that say the Ketim are the Seleucids. And there's another group like myself who say the Ketim are the Romans. And the point is that, for instance, in the Maccabee books, you know, one of them will start, and Alexander the Great came from the land of the Katim. So you see, even in that book, it's the Macedonians at that point, you see. So it can be any foreign Western army. And the question is, is it as the Maccabee books, the Greeks or the Macedonians, or is it as it is here in Daniel, the Greeks, I mean the Romans? And I think we will make very uh, strenuous arguments for the fact, and that's a very crucial argument in Dead Sea Scroll Studies. Why? Because depending on how you date the Katim, that's how you're going to date the Dead Sea Scrolls. Follow me? So if you think that the enemies in the scrolls are the Greeks, well, you're going to put all the scrolls back in the second century BC. If you think the enemies of the scrolls are the Romans, then you're going to put the scrolls in the first century uh, BC and the first century AD. And that's the basic argument in Dead Sea Scroll Studies. Now, I not only think I'm right, I know I'm right, but that's not going to convince anyone else, and it may not even convince you. But I know, I'm in these people's brains, I understand their mindset, I know what they're thinking, and there's so much evidence to show in the text themselves. When they discuss the army of the Katim, this is not some two-bit kingdom like the Seleucids. I mean, they're fighting a, a huge, powerful uh, uh, empire that's overthrowing country after country, that's enslaving the world, that's uh, taking huge taxes from everyone, that's got you know no pity on fortresses, that's killing people left, right, and center, I mean, this is big time stuff. This is not little, some little two-bit neighboring kingdom. And uh, when you see what they're talking about with the Katim, I think it'll be clear that it's the Romans. But I don't want to prejudice you, even though I already have. Uh, uh, you still have to decide for yourself these things. That's for you to decide. I can tell you that I am that's not necessarily the majority of Dead Sea Scroll studies, but that doesn't mean I'm wrong. Uh, it only means that I'm dealing with some colleagues who tend to be lemmings, uh, but we'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay, so here the Katim are mentioned. That's what's important about chapter 11, the mention of the Katim. So, uh, and it looks like that in the Maccabee books that we're going to read next, if you've been reading them, one and two, you'll see that Judas Maccabee <coughs> signs a treaty of friendship with the, uh, with the uh, Spartans, I think. And then later on, there are some treaties of friendships with the with the uh, with the uh, Romans. 
And uh, so uh, the Maccabees are happy to have the Romans come into the uh, area because they think they're a balancing force against the uh, Seleucids at this point. So they're happy to have, uh, you know, my enemy's enemy is my friend. They're happy to have a uh, powerful uh, uh, ally of people coming in. to the area to help them, but they don't know that they're going to be consumed by their ally, which is what's going to happen. And uh, that is going to be a, a really, you can say George Bush made a terrible mistake in foreign policy or whatever, because he got into this Iraq struggle. I don't think he did. I think uh, this was something that had to be done in my personal view. And I think he just hasn't prosecuted out there enough with enough energy and, uh, and determination because he's got all kinds of people behind him advising him every which way and then never nothing ever gets done properly. But I think his uh, intentions were horrible and he meant well. Uh, and uh, he hasn't prosecuted it with the energy that he needs to do it because uh, we've got some serious enemies out there that have to be silenced uh, if we're going to survive. Uh, in Long Beach, California, I mean, I mean, I mean, Topeka, Kansas is in good shape. I don't know about Long Beach. And I already went into <coughs> with you guys before, so I'm not unhappy that those guys were out there. I just wish they were dying for uh, a much better uh, you know, game plan. Uh, but um, it may turn out that some people think that we'll hear in debates that he was mistaken in his foreign policy, he made some mistakes. And uh, we're going to hear, uh, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that if you look at this, Judas Maccabee may have been mistaken in uh, entertaining relations with the Romans because he brought a serpent into the, into the country, but they were going to come. I don't think it had anything to do with whether he was their friend or he brought them in or not. He, he did his best, I think, and under the circumstances that he had to act in. But unfortunately, he brought in the uh, he brought in the consumer of nations. Put it that way, and the eater of nations. I think that will be that will be portrayed as eating their eating their prey in the Habakkuk commentary when we look at it. Anyway. Forces will come, profane the, temp, uh, the, the temple citadel, abolish the perpetual sacrifice, there it is again, repeated as another time, install the disastrous abomination there. All that we parallel now in the Maccabee books. Again, it's Antiochus Epiphanes. To break the covenant, corrupt with flatteries, and all those who know God, though, will stand firm. Interestingly, the Dead Sea Scrolls start, all you who know God and understand his ways. Listen to me. And, uh, and now these stand firm. And in the Maccabee books, we'll hear about the warriors of Jesus who stand firm. Uh, they will be brought down by the sword, flame, captivity, plundering. And thus brought down, little help they will receive, though many will be plotting on their side. A lot of dissension. And learn, and some will be brought down, a result of which certain of them will be purged, purified, made white until the time of the end, for the appointed time has come, and the wrath reaches a bursting point, and so on and so forth. So this is guy's watching all this, but he doesn't know what's going to happen, and he's, in pretty, he's not uh, too happy about the situation here. So more about uh, line 40, he will invade the land of splendor, many will fall, more of this stuff. 12, then Michael will stand up, the great prince who mounts guard over your people. There he is, guardian angel of Israel, right there. There's going to be a time of great distress. Your own people will be spared. All those whose names were found written in the book. And here is the key passage that some of you were asking about. Of those who sleep in the dust of the earth, many will awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and a devastating dis everlasting disgrace. The learned will shine as brightly as the vault of heaven. And those who instructed many in virtue, many will be a name for the rank and file of the Dead Sea Scrolls. As bright as the stars for all eternity. But Daniel, keep these words secret. The books should be sealed. Revelation. Now. Until the time of the end, many will wander this way and that. And so on and so forth. So what have we got here? The first clear enunciation of the resurrection of there, you say, it's in other Bibles, in the Psalms, you'll have difficulty finding anything that clear in the Psalms. You won't find it in any of the uh, 
books of the Torah, the first five books of the, the, of the Bible, the Pentateuch, you won't find it. You'll look, you won't find This is the first statement of the resurrection of the dead. In clearly unambiguous language. Does Job count? Job's not in there. It's not in Job. So, yeah, it counts. And <laughs> if we're in there, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have a problem. It wouldn't be, uh, we could solve Job's philosophical... Because uh, if we say the worms eat my flesh, or something like that, in my flesh I will see God. Uh, that's not a clear, unambiguous statement of anything. It doesn't tell me anything. This is clear, isn't it? I mean, didn't I just read it? Many will awake. Not only is it clear, it's got a very highly developed idea of heaven and hell. Some will awake to everlasting blessing and light and beauty, and others will have, you know, we got the whole heaven and hell doctrine. Others will have, uh, you know, punishment. Eternal, th th this is very highly developed. Now, I don't think you'll find any other statement like this. Don't start going through there too much because you'll take all night and you won't find anything as clear as this. But if you find something clear, let me know. You won't find it, but good luck. <laughs> uh, but I think actually this is, shows that this is a fairly late book because I don't think this idea is coming in until now in any, in any strong way. And in fact, I think what you'll find is it's coming in with this literature, this apocalyptic literature two centuries before Christ. In fact, it's coming in with the Maccabean uprising. It's coming in with the idea of holy war. It's coming in with the people who are going to be recompensed. We'll see in the Maccabee books that Judas Maccabee is going to make sacrifice for the dead on the battlefield in order that they should be, you know, if he says if he didn't think they were going to rise again, there would be no point in making this sacrifice for them. So it shows that Judas Maccabee's holy warriors believe in the resurrection of the dead. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls will believe in resurrection of the dead. The partisans on Masada will believe in resurrection of the dead, as I'll be able to show you the Masada where they made their final last stand against the Romans in 73 AD and committed mass suicide, a thousand people, all covered in Josephus. I'll be able to show you that they believe in resurrection of the dead. Christians uh, believe in resurrection of the dead. They follow someone who they even think was resurrected from the dead. They, he, he actually was. He actually, these guys are waiting for it, but Christianity <coughs> actually happens. There's an actual individual who it happens to, in theory. And the whole religion is based on that, his resurrection, in theory. So they're saying, well, we've actually got one that it happened to in Christian view. So they're actually, a, uh, you have to see, they are an, uh, an offspring of this. They are a descendant of this ideology, and they're actually saying not that it's going to happen, but it actually did happen to our God. Isn't that true? That's, it doesn't happen to any of us uh, for the time being, maybe the end of time. Uh, but uh, this here, I think, it is not supposed to happen until the end of time here, I think, but I'm not sure. Anyway, there's going to be a difference, though. In the Maccabee books, particularly Maccabees 2, which is different in Maccabees 1. I haven't been reading those two books. Well, if you'll see, the two are different if you've read them both. They actually don't, con they don't continue one from the other. It sounds like Maccabees 1 should continue from Maccabees 2, correct? It doesn't. It's just a parallel, alternate version of the events. It's not a continuation. It's not like Samuel 1, Samuel 2. You know, Kings 1, Kings 2, Chronicles 1, Chronicles. Not like those books. It's just two parallel versions with from slightly different points of view. And in fact, Maccabees 1 does not have the doctrine of resurrection of the dead clearly defined. But Maccabees 2 believes absolutely in the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. But Maccabees 2 is a little bit different than this. Maccabees 2, basically, only the righteous will be resurrected. The, the dead evil people, they just stay dead. Only the righteous will be resurrected according to uh, Maccabees. I think that's the earlier form of the doctrine. This is more highly developed, you see. I um, frankly think that the Palestinian, original Palestinian doctrine was the righteous are resurrected. Why? To enjoy the kingdom. Paul feels that way to some extent, you know, that you will, that the dead have to enjoy the kingdom as well as the living. So how are they going to, you know, the, the, the living, like the rapture people around this place here? 
They're not going to walk into the kingdom living, aren't they, according to their ideology. But the uh, dead people, they got to get out there too. So to get them into the kingdom, we have to resurrect them. But we don't need to resurrect the evil people. Well, well I'm not looking for anybody <coughs> punished in brimstone and, you know, pitch and, you know, boiling oil or whatever it is for all eternity. They can just stay dead. I think that's the original idea in Palestine, wouldn't that? But this is already developed. So Daniel and Maccabees 2 don't agree on what the resurrection is exactly. For Maccabees 2, which I think is the more uh, generic view of Palestine, it's only the right to survive. And now I may be prejudiced here, and I may be uh, giving you my own. I, to me, that appeals to me. I'm interested in Dante's Inferno. Uh, how many have read Dante's Inferno? I find it very hard to get through that book. You know, all these poor people in, you know, lower Slobovia and drowning in all kinds of uh, horrifying circumstances and, you know, all these pet punishments. I, I didn't get any pleasure out of seeing all that. Uh, you know, let those poor people rest in peace. But the righteous, they have to enjoy the kingdom. They have to be, you know, if the kingdom is uh, an eternal kingdom, well, they have, to, uh, they have to get in it. So we have to resurrect them. And that's basically what Maccabees 2 does. So uh, anyway, clearly enunciated in both Maccabees 2 and uh, uh, Daniel, which shows it's coming in in these big people in this period. But Daniel, uh, keep these words secret, keepers of the secrets. In fact, the Jewish name for Christians is Notzrim. How many have heard that word? And in, in Christianity, often in Arabic too, Nasrani in Arabic, Nasrani, Nasrin, Nasrani. People say, "Oh, that's from Nazareth." No, no, it isn't. It's a different word. Nasrin means keepers of the secrets, keepers of the secrets, or keepers of the law. If you prefer. I think originally it is Linaser. Uh, it can be uh, the bread, the covenant, and, but it also can be the secrets. And you see here, in a way, we have a, a this signal here. Keep these words secret. Christians are the keepers of the secrets. Later in the Gospels, this is re uh, revised. Oh, he comes from a place called Nazareth. Therefore, he's Jesus of Nazareth. Therefore, he's a Nazarene. Therefore, he's a Nazarean. Therefore, he's a Nazarene. Therefore, he's a Nazarene, and so on. You know, in Syria today, the uh, the ruling class, they're, they're called, uh, what is the, what's the word, there's a word Alawi, but there's also another word, um, I can't remember this other word, which has that uh, NZR root to it, which shows that in Arab countries, there's still people who keep that uh, language of notes ring. You, you get it in church sign where it says, the church of the Nazarene. Mm -hmm. But you see, Nazarene is not the same as Nazareth. It's, it's a different root in you. There's two, two words. Two, two different for me to explain, but uh, uh, in any case, this is Keepers of the Secret. That has a lot to do, perhaps, with where the word Christian originally came from in the Middle Eastern version of the terminology, not the Roman Greek Christ which is a, a word in Greek that's supposed to have something to do with anointed. It was not a, uh, was not a, a well-known term in Greek before the Christians adopted it. Okay, so there's something that's going to be dressed in linen. That's going to be important for the Essenes, the scroll people. Essenes are going to dress in linen. Priests in the temple dressed in linen. Linen is not animal clothing. Linen is vegetable clothing. Very important to dress in vegetable clothing if you're a conservationist. You don't believe in the slaughter of animals and seals and seal pups. And these people didn't want to be involved in killing of any kind. That's why they're dressed in linen. Uh, Josephus, as we'll see, will be taught by a man who wore, who wore clothes only that grew on trees. That's a translation in Greek, but it doesn't mean that the guy picked leaves off the trees. It means he wore linen. 
clothing made from vegetable matter. Okay, and I heard them dressed in linen standing up in the stream, and he raised her right hand, and they swore to him who lives a time, two times and a half. Here we go. So, three and a half years now, something is going to happen. When he who crushes the power of the holy people, so it's three and a half years, I guess, after the start of this whole mess, that Antiochus Epiphanes dies. But it's going to be until about seven years till the temple is, till the temple sacrifice is restored. So three and a half years till his death, and then there's going to be more time. Daniel, go away. Remain secret, sealed until the end. Many will be cleansed, made white, purged. The weak will go do wrong. The weak will never understand. The learned will understand. For the moment, the perpetual sacrifice is abolished. That is the temple. And the disastrous abomination erected for the third time mentioned, the abomination of desolation. Uh, in Greek, we now know that's the statue of the Olympian Zeus. You know, when you first don't want to say somebody's name, you give it something else's name. So, for instance, you want to call, don't want to call someone by his name, so you give him a sort of a similar sounding name. So in Hebrew, a similar sounding Hebrew would translate into Greek as abomination of desolation. It's not the Olympian Zeus, it's the Joshmo. And then that translates back into Greek and English, abomination of desolation. Yeah? So, like, I'm, like earlier when you were talking about the Katim and whether or not that refers to the Greeks. Well, well, that's another future problem, not in this book. That's when we get to the scrolls. Oh, no, no. so Daniel is the Romans. No, Daniel would get Katim on the Romans. Macri books it's Alexander. It's Katim. He's a Greek. It's not clear. So, but anyway. So, so the reference is here then to. The that's history. the first reference. We're going to catalog then to try to find out what the word means. From the moment of the petrol sacrifice of the boss, and there's that, that's asterisk bomb at 1,290 days. So that's another calculation. Uh, uh, so the, the abomination is erected around the time Alexander Pif uh, 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 Antiochus Epiphanes dies. That's what's confusing. Because that's about three and a half years, too. Blessed he who stands for 1,335 days, which is another three years or so. But you go away. So, I mean, I can't calculate all this, but the whole thing is seven years, and there's some gradations within the seven. You got it? This last thing, Susanna and uh, Daniel, uh, there's nothing there that is of interest to us. Bell and the Dragon, you can read all that if you find it. There's nothing that relates to our period that's of any use to us. Okay, so, good. I would go home, but I don't think we, we should just uh, do that because we skipped the class last time. Let's go back here now and start looking at the Maccabee books. So we'll stay till 9.30, okay? Uh, you know, I, I, I could slough off, but uh, I think, in fact, uh, you should get your money's worth, even though I'm sure you're ready to go. So we'll stay 15 more minutes, then we'll get Let's see, let's see, let's see. Where are some I can be books? I can't find them. They're so buried in this thing. Oh, here we are. Okay, one Maccabees. Guess where it starts. Alexander of Macedon, son of Philip. Oh, we're back in the same ballpark, aren't we? They all go to the same event, basically, and that's what they know about. Had come from the land of, in my Bible, because mine stays, tries to say it goes to the Hebrew as it can and still be readable. That's why I use this Bible. But this is an old Jerusalem Bible. You find it in the old bookstores. It's the one that's brown and kind of yellow. You find it in the old bookstores if you look. You can buy them cheap, actually, for ten dollars or even less. You know, I, I don't. The, the new one they've tried to make more popular. But mine, you see, the reason I like mine, it's really, of course, I got all the everything's all beaten up to heck. But it, it, I like Bibles that you read all the way across that don't have these weird two columns. You know, just told like a book, and it has very good section headings. And um, the reason um, there's all the scribbles, because I'm not talking, I scribble things in it. You know? um, 
The reason they put those two columns in is to please people, because people don't think they're getting a Bible if it doesn't have to do with two columns. And, you know, they're just used to a Bible, it's got two columns. Why would it have two columns? I guess they were saving paper back in the time of Gutenberg or somebody. It's a totally stupid. It, 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 it just, it's just dumb. You don't need two columns for it to be a Bible. And then, of course, the section headings are really good. So you, I've always liked this Bible, so I continue to use it. But any Bible I do, see, you can get this sense of it. But do you have, I'm sure you don't, you probably have, but it came from Macedonia. Had come from the land of the Kittim. What do you have, the first line of Maccabees 1? And the reason we need a Catholic Bible is what? Because the Protestant Bible generally doesn't have these books in it. Why doesn't the Protestant Bible have these books in it? Because the Jewish Bible doesn't have these books in it. And when the Protestant Reformation, Reformation occurred, they said, look, we don't want to be under Rome's control. Let's go back to the original uh, people who knew this stuff. Let's look at their Bible. Let's retranslate their Bible. That would be the King James Bible, the Luther Bible, and a lot of other Bibles taken from the Jewish communities. And they didn't realize that the uh, text they were, they were dealing with was something the rabbis had collected in the, uh, at the end of around the first century. It was not really particularly superior to the Catholic uh, Bible, which came down through the Greek Bible in Alexandria, into the Latin Bible from Jerome, and so on. Uh, so the Catholic Bible isn't superior or inferior, it just has these extra books that were in the Greek Bible. And the rabbis didn't like these books because they had caused all the trouble as far as they were concerned. In other words, the rabbis compiled this book after the war against Rome. Uh, and when things were in danger of being, you know, falling apart. And um, they made their choice on the basis of books that were well accepted, but also books that they approved of. And they didn't like Daniel, but they couldn't get rid of it because it was a popular book, so they put it under writings. And they definitely didn't like the Maccabees books because they realized these books encouraged revolution and warfare. Yeah, the Jews have been a non-military people for 2,000 years. Jews have been really very much like Christians for you know, ever since the fall of the temple. And the Romans defanged them and uh, you know, turned them into a subject people. And then they internalized Roman uh, behavior on themselves through their teachers. Because the, the only teachers the Romans were willing to allow to teach were the people who taught a combination of peace with Rome. And that meant you know, getting rid of this warlike stuff. And uh, I'm putting it simply for you. But the Bible has a lot to do with it, the books that they were willing to uh, you know, allow in. You say, well, how can the Jews celebrate Hanukkah and don't even have the books to tell what it is? <laughs> That's a huge question. How come the Catholics have the books to tell what Hanukkah is, but they don't celebrate it? That's another huge question. I don't have the answers except the one I'm giving you. That this is how it weird it happened. And uh, um, I think the Jews only really started celebrating Hanukkah seriously more recently. They needed a national liberation festival. Uh, to one, because the Christmas was so powerful it overwhelmed their children, and two, something to restore their their sense of uh, depression from all things that happened to them over time. Yes. It was Hanukkah the celebration of? The Maccabean victory and the rededication of the temple. The things Daniel was talking about. Hanukkah means rededication of the temple in the midst of this uh, war. <coughs> And this Maccabee books announces the celebration of Hanukkah. And he says, last Seleucid king. Well, we'll get to that. You, 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 okay. you, we're we're going to read it here. You, you've got the book, and we're going to read it together. That's what's in the book here. You've got the book. <laughs> I can tell you haven't read the book. <laughs> but it's good you're, you're interested in your writing your notes, but don't let me put you down or anything. I'm just having a good laugh. <laughs> it's all in the book. It's all in the book. And if you had the book, you'd know it. And that means you haven't read the book. But that's OK. Uh, at least you're curious, and that's good. I'm shaming you into reading the book. Seriously? Yeah, that's okay. Don't get to buy it, too. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Look, um, Hanukkah, yeah, rededication of the temple. But you see, the Jews were originally a warlike people, as you can see from these books. They became defanged, if you like, to, you know, until the Holocaust. And now they realized from what happened in the Holocaust and Israel, and nobody likes the fact that they're fighting anymore, but that's too bad, that they have to fight. Because 
You can't. If they were very Christian, they turned the other cheek over and over and over and over and over again. But uh, they ended up in gas chambers. And nobody could have been more meek than the way they went into the gas chambers. It was some struggle, but uh, I mean, it's just horrible. It's the most horrible thing you can imagine when you put a million children with their mothers in gas chambers. And that they survive, that is not. That's why I can't understand the anti-Semitism in the present world, how people can be so heartless as to not sympathize with them. And even in the Muslim world, how Muslims have no, have no, have no uh, tenderness, have no, have no compassion, no pity, don't care, when, what, worry about uh, people who are just making trouble in the Middle East, actually, and maybe there's an issue over some homes there, et cetera, et cetera, but it's hardly a significant issue. You know, just some more recent little uh, minor injustice. No one's being, you know, gassed or anything like that. In fact, people are going out of their way not to hurt people. So I just can't understand how hard a part of the world is. It just shocks me. It shocks me that people would actually now blame them for trying to, to survive when the whole world was against them after what they went through. Beyond my comprehension <coughs> that there's that little pity in the world. So, yeah, I think Jews have to fight. And that's why the Maccabee books have come down. They have to fight. They have to never give in if they want to survive. There's no other way that they can survive. And they've learned that horrible lesson. And it took them 2,000 years to relearn that. And that's why the Maccabee books are important to them again. And that's why Hanukkah is important to them again. So, you know, these are things that's hard for us to understand in California. I think you understand what I'm talking about. So, Getting back to our thing, why the Jews don't have this in their Bible is because of the Roman domination of things after 100 AD. And the rabbis gave in to the Romans. The Maccabee books were considered to be encouraging fighting. National liberation, struggle, nationalism, and you know, homeland, etc. And uh, they're back in vogue a little bit now. I don't think Madonna's form of uh, Kabbalah probably is, uh, has much to do with the Maccabee books, but uh, <laughs> we'll leave Madonna to her red thread. She tied some red thread around her uh, wrist or something like that as some sign of her addiction to Kabbalah. It's good. That's an, as Jesus said in Scripture, if they're not against us, they're for us. That's fine. No, 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 as long as they don't hate you, that's fine. It's better than someone who hates you. Let them love you, but uh, she's harmless. But I don't think this is her form of uh, expression. The Maccabee books is not something I'm sure she's reading at dinner time. Alexander Macedon, son of Philip, came from the land of the Kittim. You all have Kittim there? Okay, so they didn't change it there. So here, Kittim means Macedonia. So you see, it's a, it's a fluid term. And that's why in your Bible it says, from the western coastlands. Because it knows that this reference here to Macedonia, and there's also the Romans. So all people who came in ships, but originally I think it was Crete, then it became Cyprus, but ultimately in the scroll, and Daniel, I think it's going to mean Rome, and I'll show you. The reason in the scroll, I think it means Rome, it's in one of the documents called the Nahum, uh, 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 the Nahum uh, commentary, the commentary on the prophet Nahum. It says, and the Greeks came, and after the Greeks came the Kittim. So it's quite clear that in the Dead Sea Scrolls that the Katim come after the Greeks. So I just don't understand how anyone can think that the Katim in the scrolls means Greeks when the documents say they came after the Greeks. What document is that? Nothing coming. We'll get to it. We'll read it, but you can go ahead. N A H U N. Okay. So he undertook many campaigns, gained many possessions fortresses, put many local kings to death, advanced to the ends of the earth, India, plundering nation after nation. He assembled very powerful forces, summoned com comrades, and then he divided his kingdom while he was still alive. So basically this guy knows about as much as Daniel knows, right? A little more, but not much. He reigned 12 years, then he died. Each of his comrades established himself in his own region. Here, they telling you what I just told them. All assumed crowns after his death. This is good, huh? Nice capsule description. And their heirs after them for many years. Guess what the next sentence in my Bible is? Maybe yours is different. Bringing increasing evil on the earth. Um, so we left off here.